We were turned out about three o'clock, and ordered to get breakfast, though we hadn't a solitary thing to lay our jaws to except coffee. Some hadn't even this. The first order was followed by another to move immediately, so we started and marched until we hauled up for coffee. Before the water was even warm, an aide came from General Burney telling us to move right on. No delay must be allowed as we were in danger of being cut off from the rest of the army. Lee's army was extending to the left and wheeling around so as to envelop our left and cover the road we were then on. We moved with all diligence and marched four or five miles, halting again, by General de Trobriand's order, to make coffee. The same result as before, another imperative order to move right away. Not a moment too soon was this order obeyed. Less than fifteen minutes after we passed, the rebels swung around across the Emmitsburg Road in rear of our column. It is a wonder that we were not treated to a demoralizing flank fire. Nothing but ignorance of our presence explains this lack of attention on the part of the Confederates. As we came up the Emmitsburg Road, we had an army on each side of us. There was considerable firing going on, with the bullets whistling over our heads, and we seemed to be in considerable danger. We met a large number of citizens coming from Gettysburg and going toward the rebels. They were loaded down with bedding and clothing, probably all that some of them saved from their burning houses. About two miles from the town, we turned off to the right into the fields and moved to the rear some distance. We came to a lane and turned to the right near to what was called the Peach Orchard, and also near the house of one rose. It was about 10 a.m. when we arrived and commenced maneuvering, but we didn't settle into position until 3 p.m., when we finally got into line in rear of a strip of woods not far from the Emmitsburg Road, slightly to the right of Sherfy's Peach Orchard. Our line had been formed less than an hour when the picket firing, until now quite slack, became exceedingly lively and gave evidence of something of a more serious character. We double-quicked down to the left, across a wheat field, and came to a front in rear of a stone wall. The right of the regiment was protected only by a rail fence, bordering a piece of woods through which the rebels were rapidly advancing. Aided by the stone wall, we opposed ourselves to their further progress and, for a time, were quite successful. The Confederate advance was very impetuous, and our skirmish line, although exceptionally heavy, was brushed away as chaff before a wind. This was due to no fault on the part of the skirmishers, but to the size and momentum of the attacking column, which comprised nearly one half of Lee's army. The flower of it at that. By the time our line was formed, the rebel column had arrived at the opposite edge of the woods, and although we opened a brisk fire on them from behind the wall, it didn't seem to check them much. As they drew nearer, our fire began to tell on their ranks, which were more dense than usual. We peppered them well with musketry, while Randolph's battery, which was on a gentle rise in rear of us, served a dose of grape and canister every few seconds. There was a dreadful buzzing of bullets and other missiles, highly suggestive of an obituary notice for a goodly number of Johnny Rebs, and we could see them tumbling around right lively. A great number of our own men were sharing the same fate. I'm confident that we could have held a reasonable force at bay, but they were strongly reinforced. Our ammunition now began to run low, and the troops on our right, being flanked, gave way, exposing us to a heavy flank fire. The troops who gave way had only a rail fence in front of them, while we had a stone wall, which sheltered us well until our flank was uncovered. Even then we didn't hurry about leaving. The batteries in our rear still continued to pour destruction into the rebel ranks, and it seemed nothing short of annihilation would stop them. At this point, while shot, shell, spherical case, and canister filled the air, General de Trobriand, our brigade commander, rode down into the wheat field and inquired, what troops are those holding the stone wall so stubbornly? On learning it was the 17th Maine, one of his regiments, he ordered us to fall back right away. But we didn't hear the order. It isn't often that an order to fall back in a battlefield is disregarded. The old fellow didn't quite comprehend this state of ours. We had good reason for our action. This stone wall was a great protection, and the rebels were straining every nerve to get possession of it for the same purpose. So. We held it till our ammunition was exhausted, and we had used all we could find on the dead and wounded. If we could hold on until reinforcements or a supply of ammunition came, all would be well. Otherwise, no one could tell what direful woes might befall us. We knew the fate of the army hung on the result. 
General Burney, our division commander, next came down and ordered us away from the wall, saying we were in grave danger of capture. We knew that the moment we abandoned our position, the rebels would seize it. But we couldn't hold it without ammunition, and as the troops on our right gave way, we saw it was now time for us to go. We fell back a short distance, and as we ceased firing, the rebs advanced to the wall. Some of them climbed over it and began to press us so hard that General de Trobriand ordered us to make a stand. We told him we were destitute of ammunition. Then you must hold them with the bayonet, said he. We halted and formed under his direction. This checked them momentarily, but only a moment, for they saw our condition and knew they had the field unless someone came to our aid. One other thing gave them great confidence. They had been told that the Army of the Potomac had not yet arrived and that they were facing only raw troops. At this time, a portion of the V Corps was thrown in to reinforce or relieve us. No sooner did they encounter the enemy than they broke. And the first thing we knew, they were running past us to the rear and leaving us to the rebels closing in on three sides. The battery on the knoll poured the grape and canister into their ranks, but some of them came up to the guns and were literally blown from their muzzles. Blood poured out like water. Both sides understood the value of this position. If the enemy could take it, they would have the key to our line and would be between us and Washington. Nothing seemed to stop them, and it was a foregone conclusion that the game was nearly up. Some of our men cried as they beheld the victorious rebels advancing and no resistance being offered. We had hoped for victory. Had we been properly supported and supplied, it is morally certain that things would not have gone this way. Now it looked decidedly black, but in the midst of our gloom and despondency, a gleam of hope and light darted across our line of vision. A cheer rent the air and was heard above the din of battle and the rebel yell. The Sixth Corps, or a portion of it, had just arrived from Westminster. 36 miles away, in time to swing into line and give the exultant rebels a volley in the face and eyes, which staggered them. It was our turn to show the Johnnies that they had met something more than the ravey militia of Pennsylvania, and they fell back to the region of the wheat field. We bivouacked near the Tane Town Road for the night. How any of us escaped is a mystery that eternity alone can unravel. Soon after the arrival of the Sixth Corps, General Sickles lost his leg and was carried off the field in an ambulance. He was smoking, as coolly as if nothing had happened. General Burney assumed immediate command of the corps, which with the second was under command of General Hancock. Sickles is a great favorite with this corps. The men fairly worship him. He is every inch a soldier and looks like a gamecock. No one questions his bravery or patriotism. Before the war, he killed a man who had seduced his wife. A person who has the nerve to do that might be expected to show good qualities as a general. Where dare deviltry is a factor, but I must continue my account of the deeds of this day and the effects thereof. The Sixth Corps relieved us about six o'clock. An injured companion and myself were very nearly surrounded by the Rebs when, at this point, we encountered the division of the Sixth Corps coming into line. They checked the advancing foe and saved the day. The last wave of rebel aggression was stayed and began to recede from the ridge in rear of the wheat field. We fell back near the Baltimore Pike and bivouacked, tired and hungry, for no rations had yet appeared. Company I suffered as little as any in the battle. We lost two non-commissioned officers, Corporals Mitchell and Robertson, mortally wounded. Privates Stacy, Jordan, Kimball, Roberts, and Brand were treated to rebel mementos in various parts of their anatomies. Lieutenant Adams had his finger torn off, and Tasker's gun had a rebel bullet welded into it. Other companies suffered greater losses. Those on the right, in rear of the rail fence, had it much worse. On our left, at the Devil's Den and near Round Top, there were some hand-to-hand -hand encounters, sticks and stones doing valiant service. The 20th Maine saved Round Top, while the 3rd, 4th, 16th, and 17th did their share in the day's work. Our gain was slight but we have prevented Lee's forces from carrying out their design. Lee threw in half of his army, so a repulse was more than we had any reason even to hope for. Thus, we feel much cause for congratulating ourselves. We turned out early. Hunger had such a grip on us that it dragged us forth. Most had not eaten in 36 hours and felt we could devour a horse or a mule, provided it hadn't been too long defunct. The teams with rations didn't arrive until nine o'clock. 
After filling up, we had orders to take position in rear of the 6th Corps, somewhat to the right of where we were engaged yesterday. During the forenoon there was nothing but an occasional crack of the picket's rifles, and we rested on our arms. Shortly after noon there were signs of activity in the Confederate lines. Artillery was being massed on Seminary Ridge, and the same was true of infantry, although the woods concealed them. About one o'clock the rebel cannon opened on us, and ours were soon replying. For two hours there was probably the greatest artillery duel ever fought on this planet. The air seethed with old iron. Death and destruction were everywhere. Men and horses mangled and bleeding. Trees, rocks, and fences ripped and torn. Shells, solid shot, and spherical case shot screamed, hissed, and rattled in every direction. Men hugged the ground and sought safety behind hillocks, boulders, ledges, stone walls, bags of grain, anything that could give or suggest shelter from this storm of death. We hardly knew what it meant, but some of our generals did, and preparations were made accordingly. General Hunt, chief of artillery, ordered our gunners to cease firing in order to cool the guns. No sooner was this done than the rebels, supposing they had silenced us, began to come out of the woods and form in line of battle. As soon as all was ready, the column commenced the march. Our guns opened on them with solid shot and shells as soon as they were within this range. Had no effect, except to huddle them closer. As they drew nearer, our guns increased the havoc in their ranks. Solid shot and shell, then grape, canister, and spherical case plowed through their lines and rattled in their midst, sweeping them by the hundreds from the field. But on they pressed, bravely and firmly, closing up on the colors as gap after gap opened in their ranks. A 32-pounder on round top fired down the line obliquely and took out as many as 20 files. Even this didn't arrest their progress. Just before the charge, while the air was reeking with death, General Hancock, whose front Longstreet was covering, rode slowly from right to left of his line and encouraged his men to hold. At this time, the Confederates had reached the Emmitsburg Road, and having two fences to climb, all suggestion of alignment was lost. They were now little other than a mob, but they came on and on. They were determined to come in spite of grape, canister, and bullets. Our division and many others hastened to the scene to take part in the closing act of this drama. On they pushed, delivering a withering fire. But our fire was equally destructive, and they soon presented a bloody and desperate appearance. No troops could resist the awful attack to which they were exposed. It was a sheet of fire, backed by a wall of steel. They couldn't reach the wall and live. The Confederates were now treated to a heavy flank fire, and this seemed to take all the gimp out of them. Many fled in confusion to the rear, pursued by the troops of Hayes' division. Hundreds, aye thousands, threw down their arms and came in as prisoners where they had vainly sought to come as victors. Most of those on the left of the rebel column remained, dead, wounded, or prisoner. The Union troops, by a simultaneous attack, now closed in on them, capturing all who did not seek safety in flight. Many threw themselves on the ground to escape the merciless storm of missiles hurled at them. Others held up their hands in token of surrender. He that outlives this day and comes safe home will stand a tiptoe when this day is named. By four o'clock the repulse was complete, the victory won. Thousands who two hours before were in the flush of manhood now lay dead, dying, or prisoners. The Confederates staked all and lost. No one can describe the scenes of this day. We who were participants were in such a maddening whirl that we can give but little that is intelligible. Babel was perfect order compared to the confusion of these two hours of bloody encounter. Then all was still, the carnival of death was done and we took a breathing spell. At the close of the charge, General Hancock fell, severely wounded. He sent word to General Meade of the repulse and advised an immediate pursuit, but nothing was done. This was Lee's third attempt to pierce our lines, July 1st on our right, July 2nd on our left, and today our center. On each of these days, success seemed to perch on the rebel banners at first, but was wrested from them. It is certain that General Lee regards this action as a crisis in the affairs of the Confederacy. He would never have made this charge, putting his best troops into the venture, had he not felt certain of success. 
His feelings as he saw his troops mowed down must have been quite indescribable. His admirers claim that Lee is very humane. This may be so, but he witnessed the slaughter of his men from the cupola of the seminary. And from the very first, it must have been plain to him that if any of his men reached the Union line, they could never hold it for an instant. Lee's troops learned the folly of attempting to charge across over a mile of open country against an army quite as large as their own, more or less protected by embankments, stone walls, and boulders, and with a superabundance of artillery. As soon as this charge ended, silence settled over the scene. A painful silence, broken only by the sigh or groan of some poor mangled victim. Where but a few moments before the smoke of battle, the cannon's roar, the rattle of musketry, the groan, the cheer, the prayer, the curse had filled the air. There was now profound stillness as though the very elements were appalled and stood mute. A fitting climax to this dreadful struggle, the details of which are indeed sickening. How many firesides in the north and south are plunged today into deepest sorrow? Just a few short hours, and thousands are torn and mangled, better dead than living. I imagine from my own feelings that every one of these cherished the hope that he would come out all right, or at least alive, and prayed that this might be the last struggle. It was the last for many of them. About dark, our division was sent out on picket in the field in front. It has never been my lot to see and experience such things as on this occasion. The dead lay everywhere, and although not a half day has passed since they died, the stench is so great that we can neither eat, drink, nor sleep. Decomposition commences as soon as life is extinct. As we cannot sleep, we pass the time bringing in the wounded and caring for them. The dead are frightfully smashed, which is not to be wondered at when we consider how they crowded up onto our guns, a mass of humanity, only to be hurled back an undistinguishable pile of mutilated flesh, rolling and writhing in death. No tongue can depict the carnage, and I cannot make it seem real. Men's heads blown off or split open. Horrible gashes cut. Some split from the top of the head to the extremities, as butchers split beef. Some of the rebels are very bitter toward us, although we do all in our power to alleviate their sufferings, even exposing ourselves to danger to do so. One of our officers crawled on his hands and knees to give a wounded rebel a drink and came near paying for it with his life when another rebel, near the wounded man, fired at him. It pains me to state that some of our own men taunt these wounded with their lack of success and engage in political arguments, apparently forgetting how incongruous that business is. This custom is by no means monopolized on our side. It is to be deprecated, however, as it in no wise softens the asperities of war and helps keep alive sectional hate. The men who indulge in this kind of lingo soon learn that the characters and sentiments of their opponents haven't changed with their condition. And though the rebels acknowledge our kindness in caring for them, they still claim that they are right in their attempt to destroy this government. Among the wounded, is a little flaxen-haired boy from North Carolina who is only 14 years old, giving credence to the report that the confeds rob the cradle and the grave. To keep the ranks full, they take old men beyond the military age and young ones who haven't reached it and hustle them to the front. Morning found us still busy bringing in the dying and dead. Soon after daylight, we advanced our pickets and found that the enemy had departed. Finding the rebel works vacated, we fell back to a hill where the air wasn't so thick from the smoke of battle. We had scarce taken off our knapsacks when it rained like a sieve. We should have been prepared, for we know that all heavy cannonading is followed by violent rain. Many of our wounded, whom we had placed on the banks of a stream because water was handy, came near being drowned. We laid here all day, watching to ensure that the enemy didn't make a backward spring. Knowing his desperate condition, we suspect that Lee might turn on us, and by a flank movement, secure this much-coveted situation. The Sixth Corps started off on their flank to intercept the flying enemy, if indeed he is flying. We should be quite pleased to know for certain, as we have some fears. It seems incredible that we have whipped them. It hasn't been customary to let this army whip anything. The last three days have been a trifle more to our taste than the peninsula, Fredericksburg, or Chancellorsville. This new experience for Lee's army must be demoralizing, and a vigorous push at this moment might result in their destruction or capture. The general belief among our army is that one day of honest endeavor, 
could wipe out Lee's army and practically end the rebellion. It was a foregone conclusion that success here for Lee would have meant the downfall of the Union. His defeat means a rebel collapse. At night, we received news of the fall of Vicksburg. This sent a thrill down our spines and helped raise our spirits, for we have suffered such an appalling loss of generals in this encounter that we feel quite blue. Generals Reynolds, Hancock, Sickles, Webb, Weed, Vincent, Hazlitt, and Graham, besides many lesser officers, have been killed, wounded, or taken prisoner. But the fall of Vicksburg and the defeat of Lee here at Gettysburg must make the Confederacy tremble to its foundation. We moved back into a pine grove on the hill and laid there all day. My impression concerning this section is by no means flattering to the inhabitants. A rebel victory would have left these people at the mercy of Jeff Davis's minions, and it would have been eminently just and right. After all we have sacrificed for them, the women have the contemptible meanness to charge us two dollars for a loaf of bread that could be bought for seventy-five cents in Rebel Maryland. Even the proverbially mean New England Yankee would blush to ask twenty-five cents for it. One old female sauerkraut had the sublime and crowning cheek to cut a loaf into twelve slices and ask twenty-five cents a slice. If it be asked why we allow ourselves to be so swindled, the querist must put himself in our place, and he will very soon understand that there are circumstances where money does not occupy the first place in one's affections. The town isn't entirely destitute of patriotism, for here dwelt old John Burns, who, when battle was imminent, put on his store clothes, picked up his old musket, and sought the post of danger. He is over seventy-six years of age, and quite infirm, but contrived to knock several Confederates off their pins. He was wounded twice and run over by both armies, but contrived to reach home at night. In contrast to his patriotism is one of the wealthy citizens, who harnessed his span of horses and rode out to meet General Lee as he approached the town. He invited the general to his home when he, Lee, should occupy the place. General Lee gave him a look of ineffable disgust, delivered a lecture on patriotism, and wound up by ordering one of his aides to confiscate the horses. General Lee is a traitor to the government that educated him, and to which he once promised allegiance but he cannot tolerate a recreant to one's state, claiming that allegiance to the state is first.